But to add long love, I am able to say a few words of my own. I have never wanted to withhold anything. But until now, it has not been constitutionally possible for me to speak. The British royal family embodies strength, resilience and stability. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Queen Elizabeth II has reigned for over 70 years. She has seen world wars, presidential assassinations and revolutions. Nevertheless, the royal family remains a solid example of gleaming British excellence. Until the crown slips. There was real fury in the palace. The Queen was very upset that she wasn't told about this. Because royalty isn't always a fairy tale. But I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility. Scandal, adultery and tragedy. It was an absolutely torrid time. There were all these powerful factions who were determined to have their influence and sway. Take a look behind the facade and uncover the truth from the monarchy's darkest days. Learn of their tales of romance and heartbreak, death and duty, and understand what really goes on behind those palace walls. This is The Crown in Crisis. has ceased to reign over Great Britain and the British Empire. He announced his decision to abdicate in a farewell broadcast heard by 150 million people around the world. The radio message put an end to the crisis in England that began when the king announced his marriage to an American divorcee, Mrs. Wallace Simpson. Parliament passed a special bill legalizing the abdication. After ruling for less than one year, Edward VIII became the first British monarch to voluntarily abdicate the throne. He made this choice after the British government and the Church of England condemned his decision to marry the American divorcee, Wallace Simpson. On the evening of December the 11th, 1936, Edward gave a radio address to the public in which he explained his reasoning for leaving behind the throne. The broadcast was expected, but still shocking. It's extraordinary when you think about it that one year saw three kings of England, George V, Edward VIII and George VI. But I think what's very interesting also is there are completely different kinds of people. George V was the last of the Victorians. He was this stern, unbending, old-fashioned ruler. Edward VIII was the first modern monarch. He's somebody who probably bears more relation to the monarchy today than he did to his own time. He was somebody who prized personal happiness, personal fulfillment, and what he wanted to do over any concept of duty, any concept of conventional kingship. Then George VI was something else altogether. He was somebody who was completely ill-equipped for the job, which he never thought he'd have to do. He was somebody who was terrified by the responsibilities that came along with it. But what he had, which served him exceptionally well later, was first of all his father's sense of duty and his father's sense of the monarchy as something sacred. But he also had the ability to listen to people, which his brother never did. And that was what was so crucial. Born in 1894 as the oldest son of George, Duke of York, 
Edward became heir to the throne when his father was crowned King George V in May 1910 and was formally invested as Prince of Wales the following summer. As a young man, Edward emerged as one of the most popular members of the royal family. He had served in the Great War, albeit off the front lines, and took extensive tours of the Commonwealth on behalf of the Crown. He also embodied the persona of a handsome, charismatic prince and enjoyed the social and sexual spoils of his charmed existence. Edward VIII was the fast-living prince. He was excited by change and innovation. As a man, he engaged in lots of outdoor pursuits, uh, things like flying, golf, skiing, swimming. He was a real uh, sort of showman in that respect. Edward fulfilled his duties as a prince, as a young man, as the Prince of Wales, incredibly well. He was good looking, he was charismatic, he was dashing. The people adored him. As a dutiful son, he took time out to perform the necessary functions of the royal family, according to the wishes of his father. But even in those earlier years, he showed no great love for the upcoming office of ruling monarch. Joan here addressing Parliament not long before his death, felt sure that his son would outgrow this early unrest and be prepared to accept the responsibilities inherent in the high office of King of the British Isles. The relationship between Edward and his father George V was particularly fraught. The two men did not see eye to eye. Edward had a very specific way of, of doing things. He wanted to do things differently. In many ways, he was very spoilt, he was very indulged. He was the opposite of his father, who had duty inbred in every pore. Whereas with Edward, duty was drilled into him, which he really resented. George, on the other hand, was old-fashioned, backward-looking. He was always on his, his son's back as well, checking in on him, wanting to know and get updates as to what it was his son was doing. Edward didn't like this invasive behavior from his father, and the, the two fell out about it. He wanted to be more spontaneous. He definitely was more modern. He went against the grain of his upbringing, the establishment, his background. But I would say also that he was very petulant. He was impulsive. When I think of Edward growing up, I actually feel incredibly sad for him because I think he was a very sensitive boy who wanted his mother's love and, and really did love his mother to the end, but had total emotional neglect. There is this loneliness about him. He knew that there was increased media attention focusing on him, also what was going on in terms of his private life, and he knew he had a, a role to play that he was expected to perform. Edward, as Prince of Wales, was a strange mixture of a very good and a very bad. He was very good in terms of giving good speeches, being charismatic, lighting up a party, always being the right person in the event. He's very bad because he had no actual investment in any of it. He often saw foreign trips as an opportunity simply to go and seduce local women. He had lots of relationships and they all tended to be with uh, married women, which of course drove his family mad and raised concerned eyebrows at court. Edward's relationship with his younger brother, Bertie, was very warm when they were younger boys. However, as the, the two men grew older, life became a bit more difficult. George had a very specific way that he wanted to live. He was much more of a kind of private figure. He was more withdrawn in terms of his public image. He didn't have the, the sort of the charisma uh, and the glamour that was possessed by his older brother, Edward. Character was marked by the fact that he didn't have a great deal of confidence. I think in that respect, we can understand why later on he would be a more reluctant figure when it came to becoming king. George VI was the opposite of his brother Edward growing up. 
he was Albert, he was known as Bertie. He was shy, he was retiring while his brother was outgoing and, and gregarious. He had no particular interest in fashion, no particular interest in chasing after women, although his brother encouraged him in doing so. But as a character, he was a much less likely king than Edward ever was because he was somebody who didn't seem to be very comfortable around people. The prince met Wallace Simpson at the House of Friends in early 1931. Only a few years after her divorce from US Navy pilot Earl Winfield Spencer, she had resettled in London with her second husband, maritime broker Ernest Simpson. Wallace Simpson came from a very well-bred American family. She was very well educated. She went to a very good all-girls school, Oldfields in Baltimore, and she was very well read. She's very, very bright, Wallace. Wallace Simpson grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. Her father died shortly after her birth, and she and her widowed mother were partly supported by their wealthier relatives. Her first marriage to United States Navy officer Wynne Spencer was punctuated by periods of separation and eventually ended in divorce. Shortly after their first meeting, Edward became besotted with Wallace. By his own account, the first meeting between the future lovebirds was completely unremarkable. Wallace was suffering with a cold. Edward wrote in his memoir, she was not feeling or looking her best, and their stilted conversation turned to the dreaded topic of the weather. However, their social circles brought them together again and by the time Wallace Simpson was presented to the court later that year, the prince found himself struck by the grace of her carriage and the dignity of her movements, adding, I looked upon her as the most independent woman I had ever met, and presently the hope formed that one day I might be able to share my life with her. While Wallace Simpson wasn't considered a standard beauty, she had a quick wit and an undeniable magnetism, and Edward became obsessed with this woman who was unafraid to challenge his whims. On her end, he was the dashing Prince of Wales, the most eligible bachelor in the world, making her the centre of his royal attention, and she was swept up in the romantic intrigue. By 1934, after the prince's regular mistress departed on an extended trip, Edward began foregoing the usual airs of secrecy regarding their relationship. They vacationed together that summer without her husband, and the following year, Wallace began accompanying the prince to royal events. It was well known in high society that this affair between Wallace and Edward had been going on. Over the course of 1936, the British government also uh, increasingly came to learn about the relationship. However, it was hidden from the British public. And this is because the great press barons, Lord Beaverbrook and Lord Rothermere, had conspired together to basically say to, to other Fleet Street editors uh, of newspapers that they mustn't publish the story about Wallace and Edward, that this must be kept a closely guarded secret. I, mean, I think what was terribly difficult for the British public was, of course, they knew nothing about Wallace and Edward's relationship. They just saw their beloved king, um, you know, with his flaxen hair going about his duties. Whereas within the establishment and within society, everybody knew about their relationship. Everybody in um, the Prince of Wales and Mrs. Simpson circle who met Mrs. Simpson really liked her and really admired her and could see what a good influence she was on the king. However, it was the unholy trinity, as I call them, of palace, parliament and church who did not want Edward on the throne. And in my opinion, Mrs. Simpson became the suitable scapegoat for that. And there was this absolute rage and sense of revolt uh, in the palace and uh, partly in parliament and certainly within the church. 
King George V and Queen Mary were not happy with the presence of that woman, as Wallace was derisively known. I think that the idea of a strong, confident woman who was forging her own path in the world was seen with absolute terror by people who didn't like the idea of this person who couldn't be kept down, wasn't answerable to anyone, didn't belong to the British codes of conduct. She was certainly somebody who was single-minded, and I think she was certainly somebody who wanted to have the best things in life. I mean, Edward lavished her with jewels and with any kind of trinkets that she wanted. But virtually everyone connected to the prince seemed to believe that his infatuation with the American would eventually pass, not grasping that he was determined to make her his wife. There are a number of reasons why uh, the British intelligence service were spying on Edward and Wallace. Wallace was rumored to have had liaisons with uh, foreign government officials. The court was so desperately worried about the influence of this American woman about whom they knew very little on Edward. Well, people didn't know about uh, who Wallace Simpson was. The country knew nothing because there was this press moratorium and they obviously weren't in the royal milieu. And those in the royal milieu, her friends really liked her. They saw that she was witty, that she was warm, that she was fun, that she made the Prince of Wales happy. So I think there's a huge gulf between the woman Wallace was, the woman her friends knew, and then later public opinion. She did not bleat to the press, as would happen nowadays. She went through the whole scandal of the abdication. She became the most hated woman in the world, and somehow she kept to herself, to her truth, to her center. There was a lot of pressure on Edward to either give up the throne in order to marry the woman he loved, or give up Wallace Simpson. Uh, and that pressure came from, notably, Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin. There was also a lot of pressure coming from Cosmo Lang, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who advised both Baldwin and Edward that it would be very unbecoming for Edward to stay on the throne and marry this woman who was twice divorced. Then, as London's clocks neared midnight, the word came by radio from England's famous BBC that the King had died. Dawn finds London with all flags at half-mast. The busy theatre districts are deserted, with even the cinemas closed, and in many cases, houses of business as well. At Buckingham Palace, thousands stand silently in token of their grief. There is no disorder, but from time to time, the mounted police find it necessary to push back the first lines. With crepe on their colours, the guards follow the ancient military formalism to the last detail. In London's Hyde Park, light field artillery fires the traditional salute. Today, the British people ponder their king, Edward VIII, the new head of the House of Windsor. Sandringham Palace, where King George died. These first pictures from England of the dark days of King George's illness and death, when an empire hung on the words displayed at Sandringham, vividly reflect how deeply the people of the empire have mourned the passing of their king. When former Prime Minister MacDonald and the Home Secretary speeded from London to the king's bedside, the nation was prepared for bad news that soon flashed. A hush fell over all England, as in a sorrowing home where a loved one is desperately ill. On the evening of January the 15th, 1936, King George V took to his bedroom at Sandringham House, complaining of a cold. He remained in his room until his death. He became gradually weaker, drifting in and out of consciousness. King George V died on January the 20th, 1936, and Edward ascended the throne as King Edward VIII.
The next day, accompanied by Wallace Simpson, he broke with custom by watching the proclamation of his own accession from a window of St. James's Palace. When his father died, he, he, he greeted his father's death with absolute hysteria, and he was throwing things around and shouting and unable to respond to it. And I think a lot of people thought this was a very bad omen of what was to come, and they were proved right. As feared by royal aides, Edward showed little interest in any sort of day-to-day -day governorship. He was mainly preoccupied with marrying Wallace Simpson, and from her husband, at least, there was no pushback, as the businessman agreed to let the king have his way. The new king proved popular with his subjects, and his coronation was scheduled for May 1937. As a king, Edward took his role quite seriously, certainly when it came to being out and about in amongst his subjects. When he'd been Prince of Wales, Edward was very active going out into to villages, towns, cities, meeting, greeting ordinary working class people. There was a great deal of affection for him among the British public because he had this, this special intimate relationship with them. However, in terms of the, the business of government, he was less dutiful. He was somebody who was seen as a completely different kind of king to every other, because he was seen as somebody who was very accessible. And the glamour that he'd had as, as a younger man persisted. There was a real sense that he was the first king who had ever really come down to the level of the public, and a real sense that he was the first person who could walk amongst them and actually be regarded as a normal, everyday figure. His affair with Mrs. Simpson was reported in American and continental European newspapers, but due to a gentleman's agreement between the British press and the government, the affair was kept out of British newspapers. Convincing the Church of England and the rest of the government was another story. The Church would not marry a divorcee with a living ex-husband, let alone two, and while the King could seek a civil ceremony, the act would place him at odds with his standing as head of the Church. Around the time Wallace Simpson was granted a preliminary divorce in October 1936, Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin finally confronted Edward about the severity of the situation. Over several meetings, he expressed his belief that the Edward Wallace marriage would not be supported by the government or the British people, and explained why Parliament, as representative of the people, could determine who was suitable to be Queen. There was definitely pressure for him to abdicate from Stanley Baldwin. I mean, Stanley Baldwin saw this as, you know, an event to rejoice over, I think, despite all that was said. I mean, he was the ultimate snake in the whole system. It was an absolutely torrid time in that there were all these powerful factions who were determined to have their influence and sway. Edward proposed a morganatic marriage in which Wallace would not receive a royal title, but this was rejected. So too was Edward's request to make his case to his subjects by way of a radio address. The next day, the scandal broke on the front pages of British newspapers. The public's reaction to the announcement of this, this news of the affair was one of shock and surprise. How could this news have been kept from them for so long? 
they adored this man, they put their faith in him, they all wanted him to marry. And such was the public's affection for Edward that in fact there were many discussions, especially with Wallace, well, could he give an address to the people? And if the people could understand that he loved this woman and he genuinely he felt he could not be a good king without her, then they would understand. They were, in, in some quarters, uh, supportive of their king. They thought that he should be able to marry the woman he loved and stay on the throne. However, in certainly in more middle class and in more conservative circles, there were concerns that Edward was not putting duty ahead of his, his personal gratification. When it became clear that Edward was thinking about abdicating the throne in order to marry Wallace Simpson, there was an enormously mixed reaction. The middle classes were horrified and disgusted because they saw that the king having this relationship with a married woman, indeed a divorced woman, something that was completely unacceptable. The working classes didn't think anything of this. They thought it was absolutely fair enough that they loved the king, they wanted him to be happy, and they were very, very keen that he remain on the throne. So it really split the country down the middle. And of course, the upper classes were faced with this completely different idea whereby they didn't condemn him from a moral perspective, they condemned him more from a perspective of being selfish enough to having put the country in this constitutional crisis. Edward always knew that abdication was a possibility. If we go and look at the diaries of his friends and associates earlier on in 1936, when they're talking about the affair before it's become public news, we know that Edward was already considering this idea that he might have to abdicate in order to marry the woman he loved. However, this was not plan A. He would have preferred to stay as king. This was a role he cared about deeply, that he wanted to play, and he wanted to marry the woman he loved. Ultimately, he was pushed towards option B, which was ultimately giving up the throne in order to marry Wallace. It's a really interesting question, was the abdication a difficult decision for Edward? Because in one sense, it wasn't a difficult decision at all, because the thing that he was most clear about was that he could not be an effective king without the support of the woman he loved, and that this relationship meant more to him than anything. However, for a man like that who'd been brought up in that household, obviously to abdicate, was the most seismic, devastating event. And I think he genuinely felt terrible at letting the people who loved him down. But you have no love. I am able to say a few words of my own. I have never wanted to withhold anything. But until now, it has not been constitutionally possible for me to speak. But you must believe me when I tell you that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do. But I must help and support of the woman I love. And now, we all have the new king. I wish him and you, his people, happiness and prosperity with all my heart. God bless you all. God save the king. With no path for compromise, Edward informed Stanley Baldwin on December the 5th that he would abdicate. A bill was introduced in the House of Commons on December the 10th, and two days later, the Declaration of Abdication Act went into effect, formally freeing the former king of the heavy burden he spoke of. Edward wanted to abdicate. He hated being king. It was one of the things he found easiest in his life. The problem is, is that what he found and what the people around him found was you can't simply unilaterally abdicate. It isn't as easy as just saying, I don't want to be king anymore and stopping being king, because it's not a job. 
it's a whole responsibility, not just to yourself, but to the nation. And so while I think he would have given up being king immediately, it wasn't in his power. And so what you can see is that there was this enormous chicanery that came into play, which was essentially designed not just to allow him to abdicate, but also to maintain the institution of the monarchy, because there was a genuine fear in December 1936 that Edward could have brought down the entire monarchy with him, because there were rumours at one point he was just going to flee the country with Wallace and that be that. At 1.52 p.m. on Friday the 11th of December, that dreadful day, in the phrase of the new king, Britain witnessed her third sovereign in 11 months. Prince Albert, Duke of York, was now King George VI. He had chosen his regnal name a few days earlier, preferring to take the same one as his father in order to demonstrate a sense of continuity with the latter's reign and in preference to the name of Albert, which he recognized had too Germanic a ring. King Edward VIII of the United Kingdom addressed his subjects via a radio announcement that was expected and still shocking. Noting that he had served out his royal duties and that he now declared his allegiance to his younger brother and soon to be King George VI, Edward attempted to explain why he was becoming the first British monarch to abdicate the throne. But at long last, I am able to say a few words of my own. I have never wanted to withhold anything. But until now, it has not been constitutionally possible for me to speak. And you must believe me when I tell you that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. And now we all have the new king. I wish him and you, his people, happiness and prosperity with all my heart. God bless you all. God save the king. But what happened immediately after the, ab the abdication was that it was decided that Edward could not remain in Britain any longer because it was felt that having an ex-king in his own country created a situation that was both rife with constitutional issues but it was also difficult from a perspective of how he would be regarded because there was always a fear of Edward having a kind of rival court because there was such public sympathy towards him. He left the country a few hours later, ending a 325-day reign that brought the storied British monarchy to a crossroads. Although a constitutional crisis was avoided, and the ex-king was now free to marry as he wanted. Initially, Wallace did not want Edward to abdicate, but as the scandal grew and grew, she, she realized that it was essentially going to be her or the crown. He couldn't have both. Wallace tried repeatedly to prevent uh, Edward from abdicating, and she, she wanted to go away, and she kept saying, she wrote to friends, I just could slip away and quietly fold my tent, and she wrote to Edward and said, look, you can be a really effective king, and I shall watch you with pride from afar. She was anxious that she had become this sort of scandalous woman at the, the, the center of this story, and she didn't enjoy the attention. Bertie, his brother, was completely and utterly devastated and derailed by the abdication. He never expected to be king. 
he, did, he didn't feel that he had the wherewithal to be king. He was the absolute antithesis of his brother. His brother was sophisticated, glamorous, dashing, confident, good with people. Here was Bertie, anxious, stuttering. You know, you, you couldn't have a greater contrast. He begged Edward not to abdicate. He, he said, please, you know, don't do this to me. 1936 was the year of three kings. It was a year that greatly unsettled the British monarchy. Given how popular Edward had been, after he left, there was a great sense of disappointment and a cloud hanged heavy over uh, the British monarchy. We know that Bertie, as, as Edward's younger brother, was very anxious about becoming king. He wasn't a public figure on the same level as his brother had been. He wasn't very good in front of the cameras. He struggled to make speeches. He was a reluctant monarch in that respect, and he knew that becoming king would mean that he had to put his home life, his family, on the back burner, that he had to embrace duty, responsibility now, first and foremost. For royal families, as for the rest of us, life has its times of sorrow as well as joy. With this royal family, the British peoples have shared both. To the king, who in his own words now enters upon a new life, and to his charming queen, Britain and Empire wish many years of happiness. Long may they reign. God save the king. York becomes king, his Duchess queen, and their two little daughters next in line for the throne. Britain rejoices again, and today for the first time radio brings a new king's coronation message to the world. Never before has a newly crowned king been able to talk to all his peoples in their own homes on the day of his coronation. And the Queen and I will always keep in our hearts the inspiration of this day. Thus royalty endures in the greatest empire ever known. To Elizabeth, the 36-year-old Queen, to the Queen Mother Mary, and to her second son, now King, go the empire's love and devotion. George V was a very good king in the sense that everything that was integral to his being was about responsibility and duty and dignity. Um, and he took his role very seriously. So I think from that point of view, the country, the people, felt very safe with their monarch. George VI's coronation on May the 12th, 1937, was overshadowed really by the abdication of his brother seven months previous, and also the continued sort of speculation about the relationship involving Edward and Wallace. George was not uh, a very popular king. He had been really out of the limelight in contrast to his, uh, his older brother, and there was a lot of public disaffection with the monarchy in the first years of George's reign. Certainly there were a lot of comments recorded on the morning of the coronation by in investigators that went out into Britain's towns, cities, notably also London, and they, they recorded members of the public talking about how they were sort of uninspired by the, by the new king, how they worried about his, his psychological preparedness for the role. They were concerned about his stammer, whether he had the health to sustain himself as king. There was a sense here that the king was something of a damp squib, and that the, the event overall wasn't as, as magnificent as it, as it could have been had it been that Edward was being crowned. I think it's really interesting that both George V and uh, then George VI unexpectedly came 
to the throne. And I think that's very difficult because in these regal and aristocratic families, the heir is really conditioned and expected to become king and grows up with a sense of their destiny and all that entails. And the brother never really uh, thinks that they are going to become king. So I think it, with both George V and Bertie, George VI, it was a seismic shock. Um, and there's a great adjustment that has to happen with that. George VI uh, approached his role as monarch seriously with a sense of duty and diligence. He sought to emulate the best qualities of his father's reign, notably emphasizing how he was putting his life and his, his sense of duty ahead of all else. And this image of him was, of course, in direct contrast with his brother, who had put personal fulfillment uh, ahead of national duty. He was stripped of his Royal Highness status and demoted to the Duke of Windsor. Edward and Wallace moved to France. Essentially, however, they were exiled. They could not return home without the permission of his brother, the new King George VI, for fears it could cause public unrest. To keep him in line, the government threatened to suspend payments from his financial settlement. Twenty-five years ago, the romance of the century reached full flower at a castle in Mont, France. There, the king who abdicated his throne married the woman he loved. The Duke of Windsor and Mrs. Wallace Warfield Simpson, the king and the commoner, became man and wife. The duke had succeeded his father, King George, on the throne of England, until, in a speech beginning with the famous words, at long last, he gave up his throne rather than give up marriage to Mrs. Simpson. It was a romance that rocked the empire, but it thrilled the world. And every step of their honeymoon received full... Edward, the king who gave up his throne for love, is now enjoying his honeymoon far from the pomp and circumstance which surrounded him as ruler of the world's greatest empire. His was the first voluntary abdication in a thousand years of British history. An abdication he explained to his far-flung empire in the most dramatic and heart-rending farewell ever broadcast. But you... Believe me, but you believe me when I tell you that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility without the help and support of the woman I love. On June 3rd, the world waited at the gates of the heavily guarded Chateau de Cannes for the news that the greatest royal courtship of all time had reached its climax, the wedding of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. The ceremony took place in the ancient chateau that symbolized the romance of royalty in the days of old. The Reverend Jardine, the clergyman who defied his superiors to perform the wedding service of the Church of England for his former king, is rushed to the chateau in the car which Edward sent to the station to meet him. Mayor Charles Mercier of Mont, whose civil ceremony actually united the Duke and Duchess, poses with his badge of office, the tricolor sash of France. As the aged gatekeeper toasts the newlyweds, the Duke and Duchess appear to have their wedding pictures taken. Here comes the bride to join Edward in the happiest moment of their lives. The former Baltimore Belle wears a gown and jacket of the now famous Wallace Blue, a light shade especially designed for her. Like all other newlyweds, they feel a bit self-conscious with the press recording the wedding of the man who surrendered the greatest throne in the world for the woman of his choice. At 41, she is the popular June bride of the man described for so many years as the world's most eligible bachelor. Now a 43-year-old bridegroom. One final pose with the wedding party before they depart on their honeymoon. And like a prince and princess in storybooks, the world hopes Edward and Wally will live happily ever after.
On June 3, 1937, Edward and Simpson were married at the Chateau de Candé in France's Loire Valley by the one royal chaplain who agreed to perform the service. The wedding day was a bittersweet affair. Prior to the wedding, Edward had been delivered two visceral blows. One, he was told that his wife would never get the HRH title, Her Royal Highness, and it is no exaggeration to say that he received this news like a sort of fatal gunshot wound from which he never, ever recovered. Um, and the second was to be told that no member of his family would be attending the wedding. The wedding was actually quite a sad affair, and, and they only had 12 guests. And those that were present could see that this was a massive come down for the former King of England. Wallace was terrified by the fallout of the, the abdication crisis. She was hounded by the press. She was essentially ostracized by the, the high society circles that she'd previously spent time in. This was really difficult for her. And it wasn't really until the marriage with Edward was finalized uh, in July 1937, and she was the, the Duchess of Windsor, that she was really accepted again as part of high society circles. And she had to do much to, if you like, regain the confidence and trust uh, of people she'd previously called friends. I think what's desperately sad is the night before the wedding, Sir Walter Monckton, Edward's aide, said to Wallace, the people hate you very much, but if you make the king happy, they will love you and they will forgive you. Well, actually, for 35 years, every single day after the wedding, she did her best to fulfill him, to make him happy, and she genuinely did make him happy, and yet the court of public opinion never forgave her. Now known as the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, Edward and Simpson spent much of their remaining years in France, at odds with the British royal family. He was refused in a, an official or semi-official role working for the British government, although he did request one numerous times in, in letters to his brother and members of the government. Instead, he would live out the rest of his days with his wife, touring Europe, living in France, living in Paris, going out to North America, essentially socialising with high society celebrities, with Hollywood celebrities. They lived a, a life of easy retirement. Uh, he spent much of his time on the golf course in a kind of unhappy, in a kind of unhappy position, uh, never really getting to fulfil the ambitions he'd once had for himself and for Britain. well, was this a great love affair or was it a tragedy? And my answer would be both. Towards the end of their life, the more it became us against the rest of the world, it then became a genuine love affair and they relied on each other. And what I think is so touching is that towards the end of his life, Edward said that he did not have one breath of regret about what had happened because every day he was so happy to be with Wallace. For him, there was no regret. He had this woman that he was so passionate about, but the surrounding events were traumatic and there is a sense of a Shakespearean tragedy unfolding. <laughs> 